continue our study in Romans chapter 6, verse 12 through 14. So let's read this verse together. Let's stand up. <clears throat> let's read them together. Ready? Go. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. Amen. <clears throat> Okay, let me pray and we'll start. Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us an opportunity to serve you um, for the past year, this 2017, as we close this year. Let us re reflect on your blessings upon us and upon our church, upon our family, and other things that we were involved with. Most, most of all, let us thank you for your guidance through our lives up to this point. And please continue your blessing throughout our rest of our lives so we can always walk with you and be in the light and be the salt and light in this world so we can also influence other people with your words. Um, uh, Lord, I pray for uh, Jean and Michael. Um, they're uh, staying home today because of the, um, the baby that they're carrying at this point. Please be with them. Uh, we believe in your almighty power so please um, preserve their health and, and uh, sustain their uh, life until everything is resolved and it's it's this difficult challenge and every um, a mother who carry a baby always have some issues here and there but we rely on you solely for your uh, providence and your uh, grace and mercy upon them and also please be with us today we're uh, covering Romans chapter 6, 12, verse, uh, 12 through 14, as we continue to study, please be with us and enlighten us. Even though it's a repetition of many different things that we discussed so far, but please remind us what we should be doing in this life. Thank you for being with us. In Jesus' name, I pray. <clears throat> okay. This is a continuation of the same section. Chapter 6, the subtitle actually says, Death, Dead to Sin, Alive to God. That's the thing. And Romans chapter 6, uh, 12, 6, 12 through 14 is a kind of capturing small, mini connecting part between that preceding part and the rest of it. So, I mean, 14 is really, really difficult to just take it from there and then explain because 15 continues what it really means from 14. But let's pick up from verse 12. It says, Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. So it, please note here it's a mortal body. Body, we'll, or we're going to lose. It's going to die someday. When we resurrect from the dead, we're not going to have the same body. A resurrected body is a totally different body. So this body that we're living in right now, it's a temporal one. Go up. <clears throat> yeah, based on that, some people go too far. They say spiritual is good, physical is bad. So sometimes... This book may not mention it, but sometimes they say this. Since body is not good, physical, you can do whatever you want to do with your body. It can, it can go either way. Because one thing is, since it's bad, don't do anything about your pleasing your body to your body. Just do any, everything about spiritual thing. Or they can go to the other extreme. You can do whatever you want to do with your body because it's no good. Because you, as long as your spirit is, spirit is saved, you're fine. That's what they're saying, docetists. Dangerous, dangerous heresy. Anyway. <clears throat> yeah. 
So verse 12 is basically saying, don't let your sin, right, reign in your mortal body. Reigning is the word that's used for kingship. So let's take a look at the, the word, what it means. This is the word that they used. And it says, rule, reign, be king. So ruling as a king. So back in the old days, if you were a king, what can they do? They can dictate everything about your life, right? I mean, regular people, uh, public, they were dictated by, ruled by the king. Whenever he says something, you got to obey. So verse 12 is basically saying, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Because if your body has passion, that sinful nature dictates you as a king, then guess what? You will just do a lot of sinful things. And uh, Paul's saying, don't do that. To understand this, this verse, we have to go back and remind ourselves about the preceding verses. Let's take a look at verse <clears throat> 8. No, actually, we have to go back all the way to verse 3. Chapter 6, verse 3 says this, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized, right? Do you not know, meaning you know. Right? He's not really asking for the answer. He's saying, do you not know? You already know this. If you know this, verse 8 says, Now if we have died with Christ, which means you already know, we believe that he will also live with him. We believe. So you, if you know certain <coughs> truth, then you will believe that. <clears throat> Verse 9 says, We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. So you all know that again. Resurrection, once it happens, that's it. And verse 11 says, So you also must consider yourselves, consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. So Paul is telling his fellow Christians in Rome, saying, you got to know this, you got to believe this, you know this fact that resurrection, then you have to consider yourself. If you look at verse 11, it says, this, So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. And it says, Let not sin, therefore, because you're dead to sin and alive to God. So you should not let your sin reign over you. And he's using a lot of knowledge here, especially being slave to sin versus being slave to the Lord, uh, going back and forth. If you actually tell somebody who's a slave and saying, hey, don't live like slave, you're free. Yeah, then that's not really a, a really a nice thing to say because he's already or she's already a slave. You don't talk about his status. But Paul is saying, you're already freed from sin. So don't let that, don't let that reign over you. So think about that. So he knows we're freed from sin, but we're living like slaves right now. That's how he saw us. Is that the same concept of baby Christian? Not really. In a way, yes, but not really. He's talking to actual Christians here. So are we always sinning? No, but we're not perfect either. So he saw us doing this uh, sinful thing. So he's, he's basically saying, don't do that. Don't do that. He's telling us. Let's continue. He's making, verse 13 says, Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness. So, do not present your members to sin. So, when he says do not present, it's imperative, right? Just the order and commandment, don't do it. It's involved with our will, willpower. Yeah. In this passage, this, this, this context, he's not saying, let God not do this. He's saying, do not. 
He's asking us, the audience, don't do that, guys. So people just say, because of our somehow incomplete understanding about predestination or God's power or God's almighty providence, we're saying, okay, I don't have to do anything because God does everything. And that's exactly the concern that uh, Wesley's had. Because they're saying, okay, if you think of it that way, then you are going to be a lazy Christian. So Leslie, Leslie and uh, his brother, <clears throat> those brothers, they come up with Methodists. We got to do this. We got to do all the discipline that we can do so we can achieve our sanctification and glorification on our own, which was too much. But they had a legitimate concern about people misunderstanding God's providence and saying, we're not going to do anything. Bible says both. God does everything. You've got to do your best. How, does we, how do we reconcile this, right? I don't think there's anybody who actually completely reconciled that the explanation about God's providence and people's, uh, humans' free will. But we all know, eventually, God's plans will be fulfilled, not our own activities. But the Bible also says you've got to do your best based on what God wants you to do. So this is what it is. Verse 13 says, Do not present <clears throat> your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. So instead of doing this for evil things, do a good thing. So he's asking us actively, willfully, involved with the right thing to do. Right thing, right? People say this. Uh, let's take a look at this. <clears throat> You are what you eat. Physically, if you keep on eating junk food, what happens? You start gaining weight. That's the first sign. When you gain weight, though, do you feel it? My skin got thicker. You don't really feel it until you get on the, yeah, the scale. It's, whoops, I gained five pounds, right? But you don't really feel it unless you gain like 20 pounds, pounds, right? So what you eat, you and what you eat is physically the same thing. You may not feel it, but when you eat junk food, you may not feel bad about that right away either. It takes time to kick in. Spiritual things, same thing. If you let your sin reign over you, you're going to commit sin over and over and over again without feeling anything spiritually. You still attend the church. You still read the Bible sometimes. You still pray before you eat, so you think you're Christian, good Christians, right? But spiritually, you're kind of dying or dead already. You've been dead anyway, or something, right, in that nature. You're not alive, but you may not feel your spiritual status. In this case, Paul is not talking about dead people in a spiritual way but he's talking about the people who are spiritually alive. So it's like, yeah, don't, don't let... Sanctification is not always going upwards, as you know. It can go down, too. Depends on what happens. So he's saying this. Spiritually, you got to think about this. Let's take a look at a similar analogy in his other books. Let's go to Philippians chapter 2. <clears throat> Philippians is after Ephesians. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 2, the beginning part, beginning uh, from, the, from verse 1 through verse 11, is talking about Jesus, his humility here, his humility. And then, Paul is continuing his exhortation to his fellow Christians, right? Brothers and sisters. Verse 12 says, hmm, yeah, verse 12. Let's read verse 12 and 13 together. 
Ready? Go. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now that not only is in my presence, but more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So verse 12 says this, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. A lot of people stop right there. It says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. It sounds like you will work out. You will work towards your own salvation. <clears throat> if you stop right there. But Paul's emphasizing you got to do your best to work out your salvation, your own salvation. But that was not the end of the sentence. Verse 13 says, For, because it is God who works in you. He emphasized that it's not you. God is working in you. But you got to do your best. Verse 12 and 13 has both ends. For, because it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So eventually God will do whatever he planned to do in you. But Paul saying, you got to work out your own salvation. Somehow, he didn't explain any longer, any more about this verse. And I hope, I believe that recipients, original recipients, knew what Paul was talking about. Yeah. We all think that we're getting a lot better education today. But when we look at this original audiences, they didn't go to college, I don't think. They didn't really get their master's degree. But somehow they understood what Paul was saying. Much better than us, right? So it's interesting. So education and all those things, it helps, but it, it's not really a requirement to become a good Christian. Do you have a question? Yeah. But uh, uh, being a good thinker is a requirement for a Christian. Oh, yeah. Think about this. this. These letters are simple letters, but they're not really easy to understand either. If you don't think, you're, if you're in a rush, just read through the, the short books like Philippians and then Ephesians and, hey, I'm done. No, you missed the whole thing, actually. You just read the letters, letter, literally. Uh, but the content, you didn't really uh, retain any. That's the thing. So if you look at this verse 12 and 13, there's two verses. You can think about that all your life and still you're not going to figure it out. Yeah. It's really difficult. And he has this, uh, after that understanding, let's continue a little bit because this book is very interesting, a lot of practical things. Philippians chapter 2, verse 14 says, Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. So do all things without grumbling or disputing. So he's continuing. You've got to do this, guys. But verse 13 clearly says, it is God who works in you. But do this, guys. Do this without grumbling, without disputing, so you can be blameless. Is that me who is doing it? Yes, but actually God is working in me. He's the source of everything that I do. So, yeah. Don't miss that point that God is working in you and He does everything for you, right? Verse 16 says this, holding fast to the word of life. So when you do all these activities, right? When you do all these things, you got to hold on to the word of God. Because He's working in you. If you lose your whole grasp of the word of God, the moment you lose that, you're on your own. You're just doing your own stuff, right? Not for God. So that in the day of Christ, I may be proud that I did not run in, run in vain or labor in vain. Even, verse 17, if I am to be poured out as a drink offering 
upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. Please note verse 17. He says, it's okay for me to be poured as a drink offering. Drink offering is this. All the sacrifice is done. At the last minute, you have a drink, wine, or whatever it is. That's the offering. So you, you pour it. You have, let's say you have a lamb, right? As an offering or sacrifice. You have drink offering. You pour it. It's still burning, whatever it is. What happened to the drink offering? Do you see that? On top of lamb? Yeah, it's right there. The liquid is like flying and it's right. No, you don't see any. Paul is saying basically he's an apostle. He's been teaching. He's doing everything for them. But guess what, guys? You don't have to recognize me. I can be just burned in that offering process. But as long as you guys see that, that God is working in you, and you got to do your best to work out your own salvation, that's all that counts. Now, I'll be proud of you guys as a teacher. That's what he's saying. Yeah. I can, I, I can identify with that statement big time because you guys don't have to call me, you know, hey, Pastor Sam, what's going on? You don't have to really do that. All I want to see is that you guys see who Christ is. And then eventually you're going to follow him as the ultimate teacher, right? We're just in between you and Christ, so I can introduce you to Christ, not to me, or my, not to my school, or my uh, education. No, it doesn't count. I'm just trying to get you to that path. This is where Jesus wants you to go. That's what you're supposed to be doing based on the Bible. That's all you need to do. So when I see that, I see God's providence and His work and His mercy and love upon you. We're talking about God's love right there. That's it. Yeah. It's always good to get a phone call or a text message from you guys, but <clears throat> yeah. Which I really rarely do anyway, but it's okay. Yeah. Let's go back to Romans chapter six. <clears throat> So, our effort versus what God does, there's a little uncertainty there. We all know God is the one who does it based on Philippians chapter 2. But Paul, in this context, Romans chapter 6, he's saying, you got to do your best. So, verse 13 says this, Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. When it says members, what does that mean? Your members. Your body, right? So he's using this word members. It means different parts of body. It can be your hands, it can be your feet, right? Or your mouth, speech, right? Different things. He's saying your members. A lot of times people say good things about you know, church and Bible with their mouth. What they do, what they watch, what they think, it's different sometimes. It can be a simple thing, right? Please remember, he's saying he, your members not your spirit or mind. He's basically saying your body, your physical body, even though it's not going to stay forever, it's going to die and then resurrect with a different body. But this body, with this incomplete body, you got to, you got to present it to God to be used as the righteousness. Do you know why he's emphasizing this on? incomplete body to be used in a good way? Can we think about good examples of someone who used his incomplete body for the accomplishment of the righteousness? So whenever I ask you about the example, what's the best example in the Bible? Jesus, right? When he was born, his body was perishable body, 
right? It was not a resurrected body. I think Thomas once explained to us. So what did he do? Because it was not a resurrected body, he was able to die on the cross. To die on the cross, he cannot have a he couldn't have the perfect body, right? And that the ultimate consummation of God's will and his righteousness in, in that crucifixion was accomplished through his body, the earthly, the worldly body. So that's the example we have to follow, right? Not anybody else, not the pastor, not the, the elders who you know, respectable person right there and here and there. No, Jesus did it by himself, so we have to follow that footstep. We're not going to die on the cross, hopefully not, but we are going to do a lot of righteous things with our body. We can and we should. That's what we have to, sh what, we, what we need to strive for through our lives. So that's a very important point, I thought. So let's take a look at this. <clears throat> so you have to use your members, present your members to God as instruments for righteousness. Verse 14 says this. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. And again, verse 14, I cannot just stop right there, because if I explain everything there, guess what? Verse 15 starts like this, it's, which we're going to cover next week. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law, but under grace? So he's explaining himself what it means. But verse 14 says, though, you're free from the law, it says. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you're not under law, but under grace. What does that mean? Just like this uh, docetist, you know, docetism says, oh, spiritual is good, the uh, physical is bad, so law is bad, the grace is good. Is that how we see it? Paul says you're not under law, now you're under grace. Since you're not under law, you're not, sin cannot have dominion over you. So law sounds really bad in this context, right? Let's take a look at a verse or two about this. Let's go to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. <clears throat> As you can see, Paul's writing is very interesting because he's always saying, is that the case? He always answers his own question. Certainly not, you know. <clears throat> Uh, don't let it be. You know, he's always saying that. Galatians is not an exception. So let's take a look at from verse 21. Galatians 3, verse 21. <clears throat> it says this, Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. If a law had been given that could give life, the righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Please note, given to those who believe, not given to everyone in this world. Verse 23, Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned, until the coming faith would be revealed. It doesn't sound good either, right? It was in, we were imprisoned by, by the law and all that. Verse 24, So then, the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. guardian. If you look at guardian, the wording, that's the, the Greek word, about the person who's actually disciplining you. 
guardian concept is back in the Roman Emperor, that first century, that culture was saying having this guardian at home. The rich person, if you have a um, good status in the society, you have a guardian at home for your children. Interestingly, the guardians are usually the slaves or servants, well educated. Mm -hmm. But they're not really teaching them, though. A lot of people, I think Korean translation says, Mongwak Sanseng. So it sounds like teacher. Some translation says tutor. It's, tutor is basically teacher, right? You're teaching something. But guardian is not really teacher here. So if you have like a guardian at, uh, for a high school, for example, there's a, oh, I'm the guardian for this person. That doesn't mean I'm a teacher for that person. I'm responsible for this person. You know, I kind of protect this person. That's what it means. So guardian, in that sense, same thing. It's not really teacher per se, but somehow some translations use it as a tutor, or in Korean version, again, it's a, it's a teacher, that kind of um, concept. Not necessarily wrong, but it can be misleading because their role was not teaching, disciplining them. When you look at their uh, artifacts in, back in the first century, <clears throat> usually that guardians are using the rod, yeah, spanking their owners, masters, children, right? Didn't believe that, right? So instead of teaching the hey, A, B, C, no, that's what they did. So law, in this sense, when, we, when Paul used as a guardian, it's not really a graceful term to use. Discipline. <clears throat> the law actually shows you what's right from wrong. Law shows you sin will result in death, the consequence. So you, you, can, be stay, you can stay awake. Well, this is no good. That's good. You can see the difference. Right? So Romans are talking about the law as well, but different places, especially Galatians, it discusses grace and law all together. And someday we have to study that together to understand better of uh, these Romans passages. Roman has, um, Romans has this good explanation from chapter 6 through the end of chapter 7, basically, about the law. So we'll, we'll talk about that a little more later, but just so you know. So is the law bad then? Paul answers, certainly not. How do we know the law is not bad? Because <clears throat> the Bible says that's what it is. <clears throat> so let's go to Matthew 5, verse 17. <clears throat> Matthew 5.17 <clears throat> If I told you the right verse, I think that Jesus is saying about the law, right? <clears throat> is that the case? Let's read them together. Ready? Go. Yeah. So Jesus clearly says he's not here to abolish the law. Basically, he fulfilled the law. He completed the law. Right? So when we say law, or with an article, the law, especially, the law is 100% referring to Moses' law, the first five books of the, um, so especially those, you know, law portion. So basically, Jesus he's saying that everything mentioned in the Bible, uh, one, I, I came to fulfill or complete that prophecy, the law. The law is not a bad thing, but again, it's a guardian to keep us imprisoned. See, if you get out of that place, then you are going to do whatever you want to do. But he's basically, law is protecting you in a way. So you don't go astray. Okay? That's what happened. <clears throat> Let's go back to Romans chapter 6. So, please uh, look at this. Verse 12 through 14, it's talking about 
you should not let sin reign over you as a king. And you have to present your members, your body, temporal body, for the glory of God, for righteousness purposes. And because the prime example of who used his incomplete body for the glory of God was Jesus. He died on the cross because his body was not perfect. It was not a resurrected body. He died on the cross, so we have to follow his footstep. And then verse 14 says, the law is kind of done, is fulfilled. Now we're under grace. Meaning, you have to understand this. Grace is not about everything's okay. We're, we're going to forgive you. That's not what it means. Now, we're not going to rely on our law or our uh, program, our uh, ritual, rituals. We will be saved under the faith, our, our faith through Christ, right? We, we talked about that many times, but the Jewish people are still thinking about, can we go back? They're still thinking about abiding by the law, and they think, they will be saved to the book. <clears throat> Judaizers. Uh, interestingly, the British people and American people have different pronunciation for the same word. I think America, you were, were saying Judaizers. Does it make sense though? It's A I S E R. We're saying Judaizers. I think uh, British people say Judaizers or something. I think that's better. Anyway, so um, what does it mean? The old rules still apply. You guys. We have to go by this motion, religious things, and the Old Testament is the only way. That's the only way. Again, Marcion says, no, no Old Testament. New Testament is the only way. So it's crazy. We're going back and forth. So when we discuss this, we may have to go back and forth different chapters too, not just one chapter at a time. Interesting. So, let's go down. <clears throat> Click on that. Let's read this together. Ready? Go. Proper hand washing and diving is the single most important means of preventing the spread of infection. Did you guys know this? Yeah, because I was... Um, I was working in this uh, Fairfax hospital for volu voluntary uh, volunteer thing as a, uh, as a pastor, right? So I went there and visited some um, patients there. The rule number one, when you go into their room, you wash your hands, form it for like 30 seconds, dry it, right? And then meet with them, pray with them, talk to them, and then as you leave, you have to wash your hands again. They say, they say that this is the one most single important thing uh, to prevent from getting any infection or germs. Especially those patients are, their immune system is not really perfect. So we don't want to carry our germ, germs to them. That's the thing, to pre protect them from there. So think about this. The prior slide was, you are what you eat. Preventing something from happening is the better measure than getting sick and trying to get better. Right? I told you, as you start sinning and sinning and sinning, you may not feel how bad it is to your soul. Through your body, through what you see, what you hear, you're committing sin. Right? And that'll add up. Instead of getting into there and then later on you found that, oh, I'm not really doing well spiritually. I'm depressed spiritually, so I need some, some help. Before that happens, meaning that you already know what's happening, usually it's too late. When you have a cancer, when you feel something different and you go to see a doctor, then it's usually too late. It's always better to Find out before it happens. In the early stage, right? You don't have any symptoms. But some of the doctors say, that's not good. Let's take a look at it. Oh, that's not good. Let's remove that. Then it's okay. Think about it. Spiritually speaking, that's what should happen. You have to prevent your spirit 
from going bad by presenting your members to God, not to simple world. If you look at the world outside, it's just every opportunity you have, your body, your, your entertainment, through whatever it is, whatever, eating and watching and whatever you do, you can be, you can commit sin without even noticing that you're sinning. Because everybody else is doing the same thing. You know? Is that the, is that the, is that the narrow road that we're supposed to walk in? Usually, when everybody else is doing it, it's not a narrow path. Yeah. yeah. I'm not saying you've got to be strange or strange or difficult person. But what I'm saying is, though, your value point has to be different. Not for the sake of difference, but based on the Bible, that's all we have to do. The Bible says this, that's what I'm going to do, that's how I'm going to live. Then people may think of you as a little bit strange anyway. Yeah. Think about it. If your friends, first of all, we have to talk about that later, but if you have a lot of friends, that's one issue already. But if you have a lot of friends and they all love you, then you get, you get to think about this. Well, am I living as a Christian or as a person who's very popular in my school? Yeah. If you don't have many friends, don't feel too bad. You may do something good. But if you don't have friends because of your, because of your personality, then you are having an issue, <laughs> different set of issues. But because you're living as a Christian, you may not have a lot of friends. I'm telling you. I experienced it. I've seen from different um, church fathers, and I don't know how they live like that. When I looked at their lives, it's not really admirable or something that a lot of people want to get into. It sounds like very lonely life, but the only looking at God, His providence, His truthful friends, brothers and sisters in Christ, always getting together as brothers and sisters. That's all they did. I think we have a book that I shared with, with one, uh, one of you, a couple of you, that's called Ordinary. They just lived ordinary life, nothing special. But they had this inner joy in their life, okay? So anyway, that's what I already mentioned, so I'm going to pass that. Conclusion, let's go back to Philippians chapter 4. Okay, this is kind of the conclusion part of the Philippians, right? As you know, Philippians is the one of those letters that Paul wrote in the jail. He was bound. Maybe not hands, but he, he couldn't really go anywhere. He was not free. He was in jail. And this is the book. This is the letter. It talks about rejoice all the time. Rejoice always. Rejoicing. And what did he say? Rejoice in Christ. Right? In Christ. In the Lord. Rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. And finally, this is his um, encouraging remarks for his fellow brothers and sisters, right? Let's read this together. Get that ready? Go. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. He listed a lot of things here. Yeah, we're going to do it later, uh, Joseph. Look at all these good things, right? He's saying, think about these things. What are all these things? Whatever is true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent, any excellence, worthy of praise. Think about these things. 
A lot of people have this as a memory verse. I'm going to think about this. I'm going to think about this every day. When somebody says, what are you doing? It's not of your business. Yeah, but I'm thinking about good things. Right? Yeah. But the next verse is very important, too. When you think about these things, you have to actually practice these things, right? Yeah. It goes back to Romans chapter 6 that we just read. Presenting your members to evil desires versus thinking about these good things and actually practicing it through your members, your body. That's what God wants you to do. So let's read verse 9 as well. Ready? Go. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. <clears throat> what did Paul say here? He's basically saying, think about these things, guys. And these are the things you have learned, received and heard and seen in me. So I've been teaching you. I've been showing you. You saw those characters from me. Think about these things and practice these things. Yeah. Was Paul a perfect person? No. He's basically saying he's always longing to follow Jesus. He's been teaching the Bible. As you know, if you read the book of Acts, Paul, whenever, wherever he went, he's been teaching. He's, he's been debating over philosophical issues. He was well-versed with everything, right? So he was talking to those Greek people with their philosophical concepts and the way they worship their own gods, gods, right, plural. He had all those discussions. And whenever he went to different places, he went to synagogue and taught the Jewish people. Hey guys, Old Testament is good, but that's not the end of it, the story. It continued, and Jesus is the one who is the center figure of the entire Bible. He's been teaching that. He's basically saying, yeah, however, in addition to that, finally, right? Rejoice, rejoice, that's good, good. God saved us. Jesus, you know, we, our faith, you got to. Do these things in your life. Because that's a sanctification process. The key point is, though, as he mentioned in Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, we read a few minutes ago, he says, God is working in you. That's the key point. You are going to do this, but remember, God is working in you. And you have to hold on to, to do all these things, you have to hold on to, the word of life, based on what he used in the Philippians. That's the Bible. Yeah. You have to hold on to that. And you will do this. All right? And he said, and the God of peace will be with you. We talked about God of peace, Prince of Peace, last week. Now, Christmas message. Right? We talked about it. Isaiah chapter 9. Prince of Peace, that peace, the shalom the restoration of our broken relationship with our, with our God, the Almighty God, and ourselves will be restored. I mean, you will have that peace in Christ. Okay? I know he's continuing, but I'm going to finish at this point. Any questions? Today, Michael's not here, so no one's asking questions. or Any comments? Michael, we cannot hear you. But... Um, Anybody? Question? Comments? <clears throat> yeah. Let us pray and finish. Heavenly Father, thank you again for this uh, wonderful Sunday. As we close our year, we looked at um, Romans chapter 6, verse 12 through 14. We learned that these verses are teaching not that law is bad, but we are no longer under the law. We're no longer under sin because that sin cannot be a dominion over us. And let us present our body for you to be, um, to be used as an instrument for the glory of you and also for the righteousness uh, of your kingdom. So let us always be humble and obey to your commandments. But in the meantime, though, let us do our best based on what your word says. 
um, as we go on with our lives. Please be with us and continue to bless us with your blessings, the heavenly blessings that the world doesn't know. And please be with us as God of peace so we can always enjoy this restored relationship with you from the, from in this broken world. I thank you for being with us. In Jesus' name we pray.